so much to Sue and to Tristan um, for bringing together this brilliant panel and also for addressing what is a really important um, issue for so many women. I'm coming to you from the land of the Bunurong and the Wewurrung people of the Kulin Nation in Melbourne. For tens of thousands of years, First Nations people have been connected to these lands. Margaret Tucker was a senior Aboriginal woman who lived in these parts about 100 years ago. She was the first woman to be part of the Aboriginal Welfare Board fighting for justice, as First Nations people have always done. I pay my respects to Elders past like Margaret, to Elders present, to Elders emerging, and to all First Nations people who might be joining us today. It is a real honour for me to be speaking to you tonight. Um, we've all heard about the images of a Prime Minister, quasi-pornographic, doing the email rounds of federal parliament, giving blokes a few lulls in the morning. There's the TV host getting threats and abuse for smiling at a former prime minister she's about to interview. The Twitch streamer's chat feed bombarded with vile content because she's dared to enter the space, make some noise, maybe make a living. Just any old day on the internet, right? These days, to be a woman online entails donning real or imagined armour when you open up your email or your Twitter account or you set up to live stream. I choose lipstick, hoop earrings and my RM William boots, putting my best foot forward and my best face forward to confront whatever awaits. Today, I'm matching my lipstick, my blouse and my socks. We just have to get on with it, though, don't we? While there are many professions, professions where you don't have to have a presence online, more and more of us do need to be online for our work, not just within our organisations, but outside of them where we are exposing ourselves to the public. And let's face it, it's been a rough couple of months for women on social media. Two ABC journalists with high profiles, former colleagues of mine, friends of mine, subjected to extraordinary abuse, often violent, often threatening, usually gendered. Many of you will have read Lee Sale's recent article and it went into gut-wrenching detail about the abuse she receives as host of the 730 program. ABC News breakfast host Lisa Miller has left Twitter. She would get abused during the program. The smallest mistake, the smallest grievance, smiling when she spoke to John Howard, the former prime minister. Apparently it's not acceptable to be polite and respectful to a former prime minister when he's being interviewed. There were lots of defensive threads on Twitter in the days that followed. I was just pointing out X. I'm not abusive. I was polite, but she has to change Y. There are no doubt many legitimate, respectful, polite responses. But what does that really stack up when you look at the volume of material, the pile on, the endless criticism that women get just for doing their jobs? Hundreds become thousands of criticisms and demanding an answer, a response. Twitter is not an effective complaints mechanism. It's an easy way to complain, type a few words, press enter, feel a whole lot better, but it is rarely effective in holding anyone to account. The ABC has a formal complaints process. It's one of the most rigorous of the mainstream media. I know that firsthand from having to respond to complaints over the years. I reckon Emily Baker knows one or two things about the ABC complaint system too. But it takes a whole lot more than dashing off a few words on a social media platform. You need to provide evidence and back up your complaint. Interestingly, while Twitter gets all of the headlines about abuse, it's not actually the worst platform, according to a survey this year by the eSafety Commissioner, an office set up by the federal government to look at such things. There are no surprises to find that social media is the worst when it comes to abuse. The eSafety research has some pretty staggering results nonetheless. It was based on a survey of almost 1,500 women, not all of them journalists, but all kinds of women in all kinds of industries, and it found that 62% of those respondents who reported abuse said it came via Facebook, 26% via Instagram, 18% via Twitter, 14% via LinkedIn. Now that Twitter number is probably, there are much many fewer people on Twitter than they are on Facebook. So that could account for it. But Twitter has this absolutely over-egged situation when it comes to abuse. Now, this survey was conducted in May, June and July. So it's pretty much what's been happening right now. And while the preliminary results are really worrying, they're not that shocking. They're not that surprising. I guess we're finally measuring what we've known about for a while. But I'm going to share some more stats with you nonetheless. 35% of those who responded experienced online abuse at their work or in their work. 62% had a public 
or a media profile. 57% lived with disability. 56% identified as LB, LGBTIQ+. 43% were aged 18 to 34 years. You're starting to see the picture, right? The report included that 14% of women reported they'd been stalked. 13% were impersonated online or had fake accounts set up in their names. 9% were doxxed where their personal details or contacts were put into the public domain. 9% were threatened with real life harm. 6% directly targeted by hate groups. And we know that women, for, uh, women of color in particular are specifically targeted by right wing groups. Other marginalized groups also cop it and they cop it bad. So who's doing all of this? Well, the e-safety report found some interesting um, data on that as well. 50% came from strangers. Alarmingly, 40% came from your professional contacts and 20% from personal contacts. Women were contacted via email, 20% uh, by their personal email, 15% by work. Text messages that accounted for 16% of contacts and via chat groups, 13%. And what's happening in the gaming space and for women in science, technology, engineering and maths is absolutely awful too, as I've discovered um, more recently. And, and it doesn't need, seem to be nearly as well publicised as what's going on uh, with journalists and other public figures. Tonight, we are going to be hearing um, from Meredith, Kate, Katie and Casey during the Q&A. They're our um, ICT specialists and they'll be giving us a really good um, idea of what's going on in that space. But in the main, the problems of abuse of women are well known, right? At least anecdotally. And it's all about silencing women's voices. Trolls and others do what they can to shut women down, belittling their expertise, questioning their credentials, mansplaining and heap-eating until the cows come home. And that's the pleasant stuff. It's all pretty exhausting. And in order to address it, there are a few significant challenges to overcome. Even getting some women to recognise that what's happening to them is what it is, bullying, silencing, perhaps even a crime. It's all too easy to dismiss it from women's perspectives. It only happens a little bit to me. I haven't been threatened with death. I don't have it nearly as bad as other, others. And I'll concede until a couple of years ago, I was that woman. I got abuse or put downs, but compared to others, it was small fry. That was until a pretty terrifying day in September, October of 2019, so two years ago. I opened my work email to find an abusive message, violent, gendered, the usual. I was the ABC's court reporter in Melbourne writing about all manner of death and depravity, you know, tour terrorism, craziness. I did the usual thing, alerting my managers, taking screenshots, keeping records. I have to say, I didn't really read them closely. I did the whole kind of blah, blah, whatever. I'd received a number of them over that year, always gendered. It didn't matter whether the victim was female or the perpetrator was female. The language was always ugly. And you'd often see it on Twitter or Facebook or wherever my stories were posted. But a direct email was actually quite rare, in part because the ABC had filters that would stop certain words coming through certain abusive terms. So I decided on this day to go back and have a look at what I'd been recording. There had been four emails of a particular nastiness. And as I was reviewing my emails, the notes to managers, the discussions I'd had with colleagues, I came to the awful, awful realisation that those four emails were all from the same person. He'd been given a warning from the ABC after the first one in January 2019, and I thought that had stopped him. It hadn't. And as I compared the emails, it was clear the language was stronger, the violent was more evident as it progressed. And it suddenly dawned on me what this actually meant. This, this wasn't a random get my feelings off my chest kind of response. I was being targeted, I was being stalked, I was being cyber stalked. I was terrified, I felt vulnerable, I was in my office, I was alone, I froze. I felt so much more, it, it felt so much more dangerous from me suddenly realising what was going on. And I lit, really did not know what to do. I tried to talk myself down. Was I making too much of it? Was really there any harm? So I decided to call my friend Ginger Gorman. She, the author of Troll Hunting, who knows a thing or two about the trolls. And she confirmed to me that, yes, it was serious. She gave me a contact and advised me to report it. The person I spoke to said it was escalating behaviour. Don't ignore it. So I took it up again with my managers, escalated it further up the chain. 
but I just could not take that next step to report it to police. Even though I was told I should, I knew I should. But I've spent enough time in courtrooms in front of police and prosecutors to know the pros and cons of reporting. So Graham Buckby from the Gold Coast email address, gravebb one at gmail.com, if that was his real name, got away with it. And that's the rub, isn't it? Even when we're motivated to act, to push back, there's always something stopping us. And so women withdraw or shrink or second guess themselves or self-censor. The eSafety Commissioner's report found that about a third of respondents stepped back, changing the name of their account or who could access it, reducing their activity, even closing their account altogether. Half of those surveyed simply did not respond to the comments or the abuse. Women blocked accounts, reported accounts, deleted accounts. The eSafety Commissioner's report found 76% of respondents believed the authorities would not do anything about the abuse, and 72% thought not enough was being done to stop the perpetrators. So it seems I was in good company in doubting the ability and the will of our agencies to act. The abuse might be in cyberspace, but the damage is in real life. The trauma that comes from this kind of relentless action can be extremely damaging. In the media industry, workers are already at high risk of exposure to so-called PTEs, potential traumatic events. Think earthquakes, think protests, think riots, think bushfires, think floods. A presentation to the Australasian Conference on Traumatic Stress two weeks ago, um, uh, RMIT researcher Nahisha Williams-Wynn told the audience that journalism is a high-risk occupation when it comes to trauma exposure, and her research showed that 95 to 100% of journalists are exposed to potential traumatic events. She's been researching the use of drugs and alcohol by journalists, particularly TV journalists. I got to say, I'm glad she didn't track me down. But she told the conference that journalists cover difficult and complex to topics, and they're often eyewitnesses as they're happening. And this is an understanding that we're uh, we're starting to come to in the trauma journalism space. That that um, journalists their exposure to trauma can be something akin to a first responder. And you add the on the job stresses, constant pressures to be the first to file on a story to ensure you have what other media outlets have. And of course, there's the ever increasing pushback from the audience. Trust levels in the media are at a low point because of misinformation, disinformation and fake news, so-called, which are actually rarely anything to do with journalists. But there are also some organisations who sometimes act in bad faith. But when you wrap all of this together, it can be really distressing for journalists, particularly women, particularly people of colour, or those who are non-binary or those living with disability, because when they're online and then they see what's being written about them. And they often discover it at night when they're alone, when they're finally able to catch their breath and they might see the responses or read the comments. The media sector is under huge financial pressure. So there are many fewer journalists now than there were a decade ago, thousands fewer, in, in fact, according to the Media Entertainment and Arts Alliance, which represents journalists. And as Sue mentioned, I'm the vice president of the union's media section. Every year there are layoffs across the industry and the cut in jobs though, is not leading to a cut in content. So those left behind have ever increasing workloads. Oh yeah, and the threat of redundancy never goes away for those who have full time jobs and the threat of no more contracts or casual shifts is also very real in the sector that's becoming more and more dominated by casualization and short term contracts. Freelancers too are seeing fewer and fewer commissions. This of course is the case in so many sectors, which you know you've got shrinking numbers of people doing the same amount of work. Understandably, anxiety levels are pretty high for journalists right now, particularly women, particularly those from diverse backgrounds. And let's face it, we're all a bit anxious, right, at the moment. Um, that coronavirus is sure messing with our lives. In my view, it's calling, uh, causing a slow motion, en masse, global kind of traumatisation. Many of us are confused, concerned, disconnected. And we might not even realise the full extent of the impact that it's happening. 
So I'm going to put my Dart Centre Asia Pacific hat on here. The Dart Centre focuses on trauma and journalism in ourselves as journalism, as journalists, but also in the people we're interviewing. But the advice is relevant to all of you because if we are all trauma informed, we're better citizens, we're better workers. So here are some tips for me on what to watch for in yourselves and others who might experience or be experiencing or have experienced a potentially traumatic event, one of those PTEs mood swings and sleeplessness. That's probably a lot of us right now, right? Short temper, angry outbursts. I think I found myself with a very short fuse at times, feeling out of sorts, being on edge or easily startled. That's something that is classic trauma responses. Now, some of them you might experience on a regular basis, depression, anxiety, difficult con difficulty concentrating. And it is at the moment, you, you're not working in your regular space or it's become your regular space, but we're all very much out of sorts. But when you're looking at how trauma might be impacting you, it really needs to be something that's quite out of the ordinary. Um, so increased use or abuse of alcohol or drugs, I'm not judging you. You do what you need to do to cope. But if you see in yourself that you're kind of nudging the booze a bit, as I might have done a little bit when I was a correspondent in Bangkok and maybe at the beginning of this pandemic, um, or others, alcohol or drugs, um, you know, just note it. And, and it might be somebody responding to a traumatic experience that they've had. Ditto um, losing interest in your usual hobbies and habits, nightmares and flashback, flashbacks, risky behaviour, risky sexual behaviour, maybe driving too fast or doing risky things that you wouldn't ordinarily or other people that you know doing um, sort of risky things that, that they wouldn't ordinarily do. They can be sort of red flags that somebody is ex experience, has experienced and is responding to a traumatic event. But it is, it's behaviour that's inappropriate, that's out of character, that you can't explain and leaves you isolated from family, friends or peers. These are common feelings and I'm not in any way suggesting that you have post-traumatic stress disorder or that you would be diagnosed with a trauma-related ailment. I'm a journalist. I don't know that. I've got an educated ear and a sympathetic shoulder and I'm trauma-informed and trauma-educated, but they are signs to be aware of. So I can't and won't diagnose you, but just be really mindful of that those kinds of things that um, that might be happening so understand that these are difficult times you need to forgive yourselves for not being your usual selves you do need to be extra vigilant about the dangers around you pay attention to how you're feeling don't dismiss it reach out to others and do your best to stay connected do things that make you laugh but also allow yourself to grieve and to cry. This is particularly important to understand in the cyber context of trauma exposure. Just because it's not happening in front of you, just because you can't touch it and you can't really see it, doesn't mean it isn't real. It doesn't mean it's not dangerous. So that's what you can do for yourselves. Look after yourself, listen to yourself, do things that are good for yourself. But it's also important that employers take their duties of care and their work health and safety obligations seriously. This isn't just for full-time staffers, but also casuals, freelancers uh, also ought to be taken into consideration by good employers and good employers won't do differentiate. All employers should be looking. Um, looking after all people who are making contributions to their organisation. The Media, Entertainment and Arts Alliance has worked closely in recent years with Gender Equity Victoria, and that's to raise awareness about online abuse. But more importantly, what can be done about it? We also were working with Australian community man uh, managers uh, with this important work. And this started, as it often does, with asking women about their experiences. And Gender Equity Victoria's initial report, Don't Read the Comments, noted significant issues for women in the media, the lack of women in leader, le leadership roles, the high levels of sexual harassment, and a lack of rec recognition of the gender biases within the industry, how women journalists are treated, as well as the way women are treated as interview and story subjects. Sexism, sexualization are still very much the norm, even in a workplace that has become increasingly feminised. So women journalists often get abuse, belittling and disrespect from within their industry as well. 
It was a great piece of research which led to a series of recommendations about ensuring news organisations were mindful of the gender biases within and to try and put a gender lens uh, when they were looking for solutions. And it really hammered home the point that the internet is the workplace. And so Mia, the community managers and Gender Equity Victoria has also worked on guidelines for online moderators as well as guidance for media organisations in dealing with abuse against their workers. Some of the suggestions were to make readers who want to comment on material register with a real name and a real address. That the audience be reminded of the uh, media agency's code of conduct and all media agencies have them and perhaps even have to sign up to a code of conduct. That repeat offenders be banned, that abusive material is quickly removed and efficiently removed. So we now have greater awareness within our sector of the seriousness of the threats and more organisations are putting in place measures to ensure their staff know the risks, have clear processes on how to report breaches and also offering support. Freelance journalists find themselves very much at the whim of the organisations they write for. Um, some organisations do see it as their duty, part of their duty to protect anyone who works for them, no matter how they're employed, but most seem to be happy just to wash their hands of it, and that has to change. I think it's fair to say that we'd like to have seen a better take up of the guidelines, but we remain ever hopeful. A huge part of the problem, of course, is the platforms themselves. Owners and operators seem very reluctant to act, even when it's clear they could easily respond. There have been efforts to stop the flow of fake news, kind of, sort of, maybe, and feeble efforts to stop abuse. Sure, we can report, we can block, we can mute. But so often Facebook or Google or Twitter or whichever platform it happens to be will come back and say, oh, it didn't breach our guidelines. The nipples of breastfeeding mothers seem to be taken down in an instant, but somehow the race baiters, the hate mongers and the revenge porn stars can't be stopped. It beggars belief and uh, it really does. We often get told just get off the internet as if it's that easy. Australians have been early adopters of technology. We love our devices. We even invented Wi-Fi. Well, over 20 million of us are, are online and we are one of the most internet savvy countries in the world. Embracing of all things digital has been a boon for so many aspects of our lives. We can pay our bills, access our health records, including that vaccination uh, passport. We can see our tax bills and other government information. If we didn't shop online before the pandemic, most of us certainly do now. And telehealth has become the norm. Digital activities totaled $426 billion dollars a year, according to AustCyber, an organisation aimed at promoting cyber capability, while one in every six workers in Australia is in a digitally geared job. AustCyber's digital trust report from last year found these conveniences for us come with real risks. We've seen notable data breaches and increased cyber attacks. Casey's gonna tell us a bit more about that um, in the Q&A shortly. This year alone, according to Weber Insurance, there have been data breaches at Ray White Real Estate, New South Wales Health, Tasmania Ambulance, the NAB, Facebook and LinkedIn. Hundreds of thousands of Australians have been caught up in them. The Ost Cyber Report has done modelling on what a four week long disruption to those digital industries might look like. And it's not a pretty side. Ost Cyber predicts tens of thousands of jobs lost, billions wiped from the economy. Banks, retailers, health providers, governments, schools would all be affected in some way. And as uh, Casey knows too well, Australia has too few homegrown cybersecurity experts and is too dependent on external digital companies. And you're going to be hearing more about cyber sovereignty and data sovereignty very soon as we get into the Q&A section. So we do have a lot of work to do to ensure that our online lives are safe. We now have something called the Online Safety Act, a, French, a freshly minted piece of federal legislation that's supposed to go some way to supporting and protecting people online powers to crack down on cyber abuse, cyber bullying, sharing of intimate images without permission, as well as harmful content. The details of how it will work are part of consultations that are going on right now. And it's not before time that there is some kind of legislation, but how it will work in reality when patriarchal attitudes are so prevalent, when there's so much inequality in the structure of our society remains to be seen. And I'm sure our panelists have some views on this. So enough from me, let's hear from them. I'm going to um, 
be introducing them uh, presently. Um, I'm really pleased. This is a really uh, cracker lineup of speakers uh, that we have today. Emily Baker is an award-winning investigative journalist with the ABC in Hobart. She began her career in 2013 at the Examiner in Launceston. Emily has a particular interest in justice and accountability and often writes on state politics, including breaking the stories on Liberal MP Adam Brooks's dating adventures and Labor's investigation into former leader David O'Byrne. Earlier this year, she won the Best Health Reporting Award for her story into the woes of child and adolescent mental health services in Tasmania, that was at the Tasmanian Media Awards. Meredith Castles is an interaction design science specialist who produces a STEM podcast called That's What I Call Science. She's a professional gamer and is also hosting a science communication show on Twitch TV twice a week using conversation and video gaming to teach people about the fundamentals of science. For 20 years, she worked extensively as an actor, writer in TV, film, stage and radio. She's doing her PhD on educational technology, in particular how tertiary information and communications technology students can harness the power of citizen science and human computer interaction. Katie Cooper is the first female vice president of TAS ICT, Tasmania's industry peak body for ICT. She's also the founder and program director of FutureFest. She spent 20 plus years in retail, customer experience and strategic management, human resources, financial services, tourism and hospitality, and technology. She is passionate about ensuring women find leadership roles in these industries, particularly in um, information, communications, and technology. And Casey Farrell is General Manager at Enterprise Tasmania, a startup support organization offering workspaces to incubator companies. He's the founder of brand and design studio Neon Jungle. He's with Tasmania's Cybersecurity Node, which is part of Ost Cyber, which is a network of innovation hubs that foster and promote cyber capability and development. Some pretty hard hitting folks joining us tonight. So um, welcome everybody. Thank you so much for being here. Um, just wanting to, I guess, initially, I was really shocked in our pre-discussions yesterday about what happens to women in STEM. So Meredith, um, I would like you to walk us through what a day, daily occurrence or what your day is like when you're trying to be online as somebody who's peddling science and important stuff. Peddling science, I love that. <laughs> I'm going to use that. Um, yeah, uh, luckily for me, like, um, you know, the occurrences we, the bad occurrences, we'll, which we'll get to, are luckily um, distributed. <laughs> so they're not, not happening every minute of the day, which is good. But essentially it is, um, we, we run, I run an um, a online channel on Twitch um, and we discuss, uh, we play some games, obviously. We do, we, we, we play games. That's what people go to Twitch for. Um, but we talk about, we, we run a conversation. So obviously I'm the only one in this room <laughs> talking and so it's, it's a constant one woman show, but at the same time is everybody is in the chat. So it's a bit like this kind of, um, but yeah, so essentially we just, we run, run a conversation. It could be just something as simple as, um, it, well, game design is great, um, great, great way to start a conversation off. And we talk about music and games and what the, the beat actually means in a horror game versus a non-horror game and um you know how that actually increases people's levels of anxiety etc and we just i just play and we talk and what has happened is that we I get quite a lot of good conversation happening in the chat which is um this is it's a different way of doing science communication so that 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 is my day that's my night sorry I should say that's my night when we stream at night time um but yeah during the day is is literally i uh i i put on my second cape <laughs> And I become sort of a, a tutor, lecturer, um, teacher person. And um, we do the face-to-face -face version of that. So a lot of, I do the same approach in my classes as I do on Twitch. And that is we, uh, we, we get a rapport, we get a conversation happening around the science of what we're talking about. And um, yeah, I find people respond a lot better to that. Um, but it's, it's a conversational approach that, yeah, I see a lot of the women doing, <laughs> which is a very interesting thing. And how is how does abuse manifest itself on that platform on the twitch platform yeah so a lot of it <laughs> tends to be um it starts very small and it may just be a few comments here and there so it's it's very distributed again you can sometimes just get a troll just a single troll um that'll come in and they'll just 
they just like the shock value of writing something in the chat. So it distract, it distracts you from what you're doing, whether you're playing a game, having a conversation, and suddenly you'll have something disgusting about either what you're wearing, what you look like, what you'd like be like in bed, <laughs> you know, that sort of thing. And it's just completely and utterly for shock value. It's a typical troll. Luckily for me and a lot of people that run channels, we have mod or moderators, um, and they're pretty quick off the bat. They know the terms of service and the message gets deleted and the user's banned. Great. Trolls seem to come in and do that. They know that they're going to get banned. It's just a shock valley thing. Um, and they just hope for a reaction, which you do get as, as a new as a new streamer. If you're a new streamer, especially, um, you will very much get, <laughs> they'll get, they'll get the reaction that they're looking for. Trust me. Um, but it can also, as, as we talked about yesterday, it can actually really um, escalate to something pretty, pretty nasty. Um, and that is where you get DDoS attacks or it's distributed um, den denial of service attacks where you'll just be bombarded by either bots, as we call it, so automated attacks from people that are sent to you to silence your channel. And I'll, we can discuss that later if you want. Um, or it's just a bunch of people that will come in and they will do the same thing. Um, so whether it's automated or non-automated, and they're there to, again, not really get a reaction in this case, they're there to actually raid you to actually um, shut your shut your channel down interrupt what you're doing um yeah by taking up side but by taking up bandwidth bandwidth and and uh taking the attention off you yeah mm -hmm. katie how widespread are these problems for women in the ict sector uh, karen i suppose it depends on uh what platform you're using so um i've always built my profile from a, a linkedin perspective in fact i worked for a big four bank and they wrote my first linkedin profile for me with my beautiful <laughs> i have to show you one day my gorgeous corporate um, blonde highlighted hair perfectly attired in my corporate um, suit um, and i suppose back then um, it wasn't um, it just wasn't a platform that had that type of reaction or, or inflammatory humans that wanted to play games with people's minds. In more recent years, it's absolutely the strange man that wants to um, connect with you and then send you some interesting messages through your um, closed direct inbox. Um, but I, I'm really conscious that I'm, I'm not um, a proliferous or active Twitter user. And I know that in ICT in particular, where there's any kind of commentary, um, that that tends to explode pretty quickly. Um, and, and plenty of um, horror stories of that occurring. But um, I think it just depends on which platform that you choose to kind of position your, your profile on. Mm. Emily, what's your experience been? Um, I guess like the others that it, it varies somewhat. Um, I suppose the, the joy in some way of being in Tasmania is that we're not having, uh, you know, not as high profile as someone like Lee Sales or Lee Miller or anywhere near that level of um, scrutiny or attention. Um, the, the vast majority of my experiences online are quite positive. Uh, you know, the, the number of people who use uh, Twitter in Tas Tasmania is quite small. Uh, however, there have been occasions, uh, particularly in the past year, I've noticed where people are um, paying a bit more attention to what I'm doing, what I'm wearing. And people are incredibly anxious, as you said, Karen. So, for example, for the first time, we've started live streaming coronavirus press conferences or press conferences full stop, really. That's a new thing that we would show everyone how the sausage is made. And so people are tuning in for the first time to this this pretty ugly process where we do come across as rude and female voices in particular, I think people have an ear for, you know, a tone that they don't like perceived or otherwise. Um, so I learned pretty quickly as you referenced Karen, not to look at the comments. Uh, they were quite nasty. We had someone showed up at the office after a press conference I attended to uh, tell me what they thought, which was nice. Um, like Katie, I've had men message me on LinkedIn uh, with with things that were quite uncomfortable. Um, I've had to block people on Twitter for the first time in the past couple of months for um, calling me a rape apologist and, you know, disagreeing with certain stories I've written, but taking taking that to a level that wasn't appropriate. Uh, but I find the mute button very effective for my peace of mind. <laughs> One of the issues that I made reference to in my speech was that I think there are, um, you know, some women out there who were probably like me initially who didn't actually think. And I think, Emily, you're probably in lots of ways underselling what's been going on. And I think we all do. We have this tendency to go, oh, well, it, I'm not Lisa. I'm not getting thousands a day. But it's still really dangerous. So 
Um, Katie, do you give advice to um, women in your sector about how to look after themselves, how to recognise it and, and what they should be doing? What's the advice you give? Yeah, actually, I really resonated with the um, when you spoke around being trauma informed. Um, for me, it's actually about understanding what is okay and what is not okay and making sure that you're creating a space where people feel that they can talk about it and understand that it's not okay. Um, again, um, from a Tasmanian perspective, it's about creating opportunities to have conversations. Um, it's about creating opportunities to have safe conversations um, or feeling that they're safe. And um, I know we're going to talk a little bit about this kind of concept of closed groups and how that's emerged and whether or not they're safe. But um, you know, for me, I think it's about being really clear around what your security settings are. It's about being really clear and discretionary around who you connect with, um, you know, let them follow you, but, you know, feel free to, to put up the barrier around connection. Um, but and, and being true to your message, um, I think, is an important part. Um, reinforcing. Sorry, Casey, I want to bring you in here. You sort of are, are in that kind of startup space and providing support to, support to startup organisations. Mm -hmm. um, I imagine there's some women amongst them. Uh, is that the kind of support that, uh, what kind of information are you giving to, you know, women startups in that innovation cyber security space? Yeah, look, I think I think we're fairly lucky in, in Tasmania in the startup ecosystem in particular. Um, because as Tasmania often does with, uh, with technology and business and changes to the economy globally, we, we tend to be at the tail end of it. Um, and so our ecosystem is very young. And by virtue of some of the changes that have happened over the last, I guess, decade or so in some of the bigger ecosystems in the world, we've actually started at a point where it's much more welcoming to, to women and other people that don't have the white male privilege. It's a much more welcoming ecosystem by default because a lot of that stuff, um, you know, has already played out. We don't kind of see the, um, uh, what did they call them, the, the bro coders and that kind of stuff that was that kind of Silicon Valley vibe for a long time where it was all of these, you know, high testosterone men that were building these businesses and with huge egos and lots of bragging. So I think, you know, we, we benefit a fair bit from that. Um, in the incubator that we've been running at Enterprise, I haven't actually done the numbers, but every cohort, we have lots of female founders um, that are running through that. We have had, um, you know, people representing other groups, um, you know, uh, with lower privilege. Um, so I think, you know, we're at a pretty good position there. Um, having said that, there's not so much that we do kind of really specifically to support people um, at the stage that they're building their businesses with us. And most of that's because it's not very public. Like we're helping people right at the beginning, they've got an idea, they're getting to market. Um, and so they're not really, by virtue of being in that kind of startup ecosystem, they're not really exposed to the, the kind of online you know, abuse and harassment that you're talking about beyond what they would already have through, you know, the fact that they're working in technology or, you know, they're, they're just people in a society that's quite digital. Meredith, um, there was clearly a point recently when women from minority groups who use Twitch, and I think this was mostly in the United States, had had enough. Tell us a little bit about um, a day off Twitch and the impact and why that happened. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, it was definitely um, an interesting thing. It came about simply because, um, as I mentioned, you can get DDoS attacks or what that actually means is that you get um, people are targeted for different reasons. And it's usually women, it's minority groups, it's usually women, um, people of colour, especially women of colour, um, any, any of the LGBT tags. So for example, anyone who doesn't know Twitch, your channel can display tags to um, advertise that you're a safe space for these particular types of um, communities. Um, so they're, they're very much targeted uh, based on tags and things like that, which makes unfortunately easier for um, the automated attacks. So um, a day off Twitch came because um, it's, I say, and you can, you can touch on this before, uh, later as well, Karen, because I think I'm, I'm about to say that it, it's something we're used to. So the, the normal harassment that we're used to <laughs> is, is those attacks we get. So to shut us down, they just bombard us, take up our bandwidth and shut our, shut our channel down. 
Um, it became a little bit more than that, um, especially most of 2021 and the early parts right through till about July-ish, which is what people called hate rates. So they weren't getting the whoever was doing this behind it, they weren't getting the reaction that they really wanted. So they started doing a little bit of a, of a higher level. So they started coming in and it wasn't just to shut the channel down. They were attacking LGBTQI. There were very pointed messages, filled with disgusting messages through to just hurtful messages um, designed to really get under the skin of the, the streamer and the community. Um, so they were doing both. They were ch shutting channels down with the bandwidth usage as well as splurting a message out there that it was just it was it was horrific basically um so they called them hate rates um and they just got it got to a point where everyone went this is just this is enough <laughs> um I don't know really what triggered the this is enough mentality it's been this is enough for a very long time but at the same time is I think it was really one particular streamer that got attacked extremely badly um extremely badly over a period of time over a week I think they do daily streams and every day constantly all day every day we're getting hate reddit and shut down it just got to a point where they went enough's enough and um went to the media <laughs> so that's how it started um and yeah it just became a day off twitch was um everybody not just in minorities but everybody who who um got behind the streamer and and was just sick of the behavior that was going on just went well amazon <laughs> Um, you know, we, we, we make you a lot of money and there's, there's been long, there's long run, long running, um, bad blood between a lot of streamers and Amazon, because if you're an affiliate streamer, Amazon takes 50% of your income. So it's not just overall income, it's everything you earn. So a subscription, whatever that is, they take 50% of that, et cetera, et cetera. So they take a lot of money from streamers and don't look after you in return. So it's been a long running bad blood. So they just went, um, okay, well, what happens if every streamer, if possible, um, turned off Twitch for the day. They don't view anything on Twitch. They don't stream. They don't do anything. No revenue is generated. Um, no views are generated. Uh, what would you do? And it did turn out to be something like it was, it was I don't know what the percentage was because it's, it's, it's lots of different reports of different things, but it was very, very high. Their revenue down for the first of September was the day off Twitch. And yeah, I think they had about three or four major streamers still going and most people weren't there. Emily, could you ever see a day off Twitter? Uh, I would love to try it, Karen, but I can't stick to it. <laughs> uh, no, in terms of an en masse kind of movement, I guess I would make the point that it's not just um, female journalists or journalists in general who are copying this abuse, right? Like it's activists, it's, it would be gamers, I'm sure. It's people across different industries, healthcare workers now. Um, all sorts of people are copying all sorts of abuse. Uh, and you're right, the responses are totally ineffective when I've reported people for certain behaviours I found offensive and I'm not particularly thin-skinned any more than any other journalist, which is not a great endorsement. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, you know, it's very hard to meet this, like, weird threshold, whatever it may be for, for behaviour that uh, a pla any platform deems offensive. Um, you would hope that, that it would make a platform listen, but I guess... To be really honest, I'm pretty pessimistic given um, how difficult it is to see community guidelines violated. I guess hitting them where it hurts, Meredith, as you've said, if revenue suddenly dropped dramatically, uh, that would be, you know, they'd have to listen to that. But uh, in terms of getting enough people on board in that movement, I think Twitter is so uh, divided and maybe that's just where, from where I sit, but, you know, it is so divided that I, I don't know how you would mobilise enough people for, for that to really take effect. You're absolutely right. It's not just journalists. I mean, politicians, female politicians, cop it, you know, activists, anybody who dares to have a voice and a following. Um, you're absolutely right. So I want to put this question to all of you. And it's that whole, do you ignore the trolls or do you take them on? I'm going to start with you, Casey. What do you reckon? Well, I, I'm in a, a slightly different position to the other members of the panel on this and that I have a whole lot of privilege behind me in terms of how I interact with people online. Um, I'm very much an ignorer of the trolls whenever they appear, um, but, you know, they don't appear all that often for me and the kind of attacks that um, that I would receive are, are completely different to, to what the women on the panel would receive. Katie, do you respond or do you starve them? 
I tend to starve them and block them if it's a, a personal trolling. If it's a good question that, that's challenged but perhaps negative and I feel confident that I've got the facts and the statistics to, to take them on and clarify what it is that they're saying, um, I'll go for that um, and have, you know, regularly done that. But um, if it's a personal attack, it's a no. Meredith? Yeah, but the same as Katie. Um, if it's a personal attack on a social media platform or something, I just starve them. It's this it really if if it's a question, if it's actually a genuine question, or even if it's just posed as a genuine question, um, I will probably answer them. But that was that's where it stops. If it goes on and it's just there for an attack, or yeah, I don't, I don't, I just starve it with starve it of oxygen. However, as a streamer, um, when if something happens on the stream, you although it's easy enough to shut it down, um, you also have a responsibility to the people who you've provided a safe space for. Um, so unfortunately, you do have to address it. Um, at the time, it's generally a, um, so long as it, your, your VODs are recorded, so as long as it's, it's like an in-writing thing. So essentially, I address what's happened, um, not good enough, et cetera, et cetera, um, and state what I'm about to do. So, And I, I give the people in my chat um, a place to go um, before I shut it down. So I do have to address them as well. Emily, starve, respond. What do you do? Uh, I think like the others, like if someone's found my private Facebook account to message me and tell me how ugly I am, then I just block that person. Um, if it's someone on Twitter who is asking a genuine question or has um, a genuine criticism, and of course that's subjective, you know, and it might depend on, frankly, my mood on the day, <laughs> uh, you know, but if it's in work hours and it's a, a question I'm happy to answer, I'm usually fine to respond. Um, but I guess it goes back to what you were saying about uh, sometimes it can feel a bit mansplainy or sometimes, you know, a tweet that I've sent on the toilet becomes this huge issue for someone, uh, not that I would ever do that. Uh, so it really, I don't know, I'm rambling a little bit now talking about going to the toilet, but it would depend, <laughs> I think, on, on um, what, what the person is trying to achieve and whether I think they're engaging in, in good faith. One of the great techniques that I've certainly seen on Twitter, um, and this is something that Ginger Gorman will put out there, for example, is the whole kind of that bystander action. If you see somebody who's being attacked, that there's this call to action to amplify their voice, to amplify their work, etc. And it's very, very effective. Um, Meredith, is there something similar in your sphere where people, where women come in and sort of just make sure that, that the positives outweigh the negatives? Um. As a general sense, no, um, but uh, in an active sense, uh, in the last couple of years especially, which has seen the sort of Twitch revolution, um, we've made our own sort of co-ops. So um, you, you do gravitate towards other female streamers. Um, if you can make friends with them as much as possible. Um, and you do tend to get an unofficial looking after each other sort of thing. But you'll often see them pop into your chat, for example, in the middle of nothing, nothing, you're playing a game, something or other, they'll just pop in and say, hi, I'm here. Um, and generally that's actually a really cool thing because you do find when I've been follow botted, for example, which is the DDoS attack I mentioned, um, when bots attack my channel, um, I just see them appear in the chat and they're all helping my mods to fix it and keep everybody calm. So I know that they're there. Um, so yes, but again, it still falls to you. Katie, um, have you seen any techniques that are used that um, you would suggest or that, um, that work? Mm. So we use a circular pod with a couple of different groups um, with, to amplify our voice of, of you know, quite simply um, any posts that we might want to have levit levitated. Um, we use that pod, but we equally we um, tend to also then um, support each other from a commentary perspective. Um, then there's the that idea of actually I want to have a really serious conversation. I'm going to carve off a group um, and make it an invite only group where we can actually really deeply have a conversation online around um, things that are important. Emily, do you see a day when those kinds of interventions won't be necessary, where it might be safe for women online? Um, again, sorry to sound like a pessimistic journalist, but I think society is not quite safe for women in any profession or any space right now. Um, online is a particularly toxic environment for, you know, myriad reasons. Uh, I think until we kind of address a lot of the underlying structural issues and uh, misogyny and dismantle the patriarchy, et cetera, we will still be 
um, dealing with a lot of these things. But it would again, it would be great to have the uh, platforms on board and, and trying to address this stuff. That would make a huge difference. Meredith, the trolls and the haters clearly think women are intruding on their domain. You know, Twitch has got to be an, an absolute sort of, you know, poster boy, if you like, for it. Um, how do you change that? The $20 million question. <laughs> um, yeah, I really don't know because, as Emily said, um, you do have to work at – it's just an, ex, it's an extension of – of, I say real life. It's, it's an extension of your face-to-face -face life. Um, unfortunately, until you do um, dismantle that patriarchy um, and it, it is, it's, I guess, getting the, the um, younger generations on board um, is really what's coming down to. Um, I'm not saying that the older generations are a lost cause at all because um, I've, I've got fantastic friends in all of them and fantastic um, support in all of them. But it, the issue is that as you said before, gamers, ga the gaming sort of sphere has always been the cis white male <laughs> um, place. I, the, if, I believe that a lot of them act out of um, being threatened, feeling threatened. There is no reason to feel threatened, but th that seems to be the, the case. They, they do attack what is the unfamiliar. Um, and to them, um, we're coming on to a place where we're trying to turn gaming into something that's less toxic. Um, and unfortunately, to the toxicity actually helps this um that mentality of the the guys the, the boys club um and i think that's where we're getting the kickback um that we're changing we're changing how they have to interact in games um and that's not a that's not a bad thing <laughs> but at the same time is is that it um i think that's the, the whole thing we're just intruding on a place that they feel safe can I just jump in on there, Karen, if you don't mind? So I have an 11-year-old. Um, re quite regularly, she jumps onto Roblox at the end of the day when she comes back from school. She actually swarms with her friends and they're in the chat talking to each other. They're on a FaceTime call. Um, they're sharing and they're kind of going, who's that dude? Yeah, let's not talk to him. They're actually self-regulating in an environment and they're doing it from a really early age. So I'd be really interested to see how that patterns and changes over time um, because they're really quite um, clear on their boundaries. They're like, yep, no, don't know who that dude is. Let's not, let's move away, go over here. So it's really interesting to listen to in the background that they're building a confidence to set boundaries um, on a platform online, which is great. Casey, how much can we blame the platforms or the regulators or the lack of regulators um, and the lack of action by politicians? But, you know, um, they, rather than people themselves, because there's some really awful personal behaviour that people really need to pull in, pull in line, but the, the regulators, the politicians, the people who could do something about it, the platform owners. Um, so where, where would you see the, the priority ought to be in trying to address some of these issues? Yeah, it's a really interesting question because I think one of the things that is, um, uh, which is argued quite a lot, is that the uh, the internet and the various spaces on the internet are kind of, you know, this, this unregulated place for, you know, freedom of everything. And when, you know, every time that there's some sort of regulation attempted, um, you know, be it by, by governments or when, uh, you know, even the, the platform providers change rules, there's a lot of fight against it in terms of, oh, well, you're taking away our freedom, we want to do whatever we want to do on this place and that's what it's for. Now, of course, any, any place, um, you know, that, that kind of is totally unregulated in terms of freedom, it's only going to benefit the people that are privileged at the expense of everyone else. Like that's the, the nature of it. Any sort of regulation exists to, you know, create some sort of equity in these spaces. So given that kind of the, from the ground up, this place was built with this idea that it would be unregulated and free, um, it's a real challenge now that it's, you know, ubiquitous that everyone's using it to kind of work out, well, how does, how does that take place? And unfortunately, at the moment, as Meredith and Katie and Emily have all talked about, people build their own regulations into it um, in order to have spaces that are safe for them. And as a result of that, the platform operators can, can wipe their hands of it. I think the Australian government have tried regulation in various ways um, you know uh, across the years to do certain things and some of them have worked and some of them haven't like none of them have you know fixed problems <clears throat> a lot of them have created new problems because they don't really understand what they're changing 
Um, but I think certainly the platform operators, every single time it comes up, um, you know, they, they absolutely wipe their hands of it. And it's it's sad because I think it was Meredith was saying before, like they've got the capacity. Actually, I think it was Karen. I think you were saying in your in your speech at the start, Karen, you know, they've got the capacity to really kind of cheaply automatically censor content and they choose to do it in places to make sure that you never see a woman's nipple online but they don't choose to use it in a way that you never see a man's penis online um, so they've got the technology there to be able to do it they've got the resources to be able to do it i'm not sure why it is that they all seem to choose not to like they, they're all absolutely making that decision not to is it because the the revenue that they're generating from the people who thrive in those kind of spaces is what's guiding their decision making. Is it because this, <coughs> excuse me, undue political influence for the same kind of groups of people? I'm not sure, but there's no reasonable argument against them actually moderating the content that happens there in a much more effective way that would benefit way more people than it would cause problems for. I'm going to use your um, uh, use of the male appendage to move on to online dating apps um, and the ubiquitous dick pic. Um, you know, th th it's a pretty toxic place when you're trying to find love, it seems as well. I mean, it's always been fraught, the trying to, you know, find true love, etc. cetera. Um, and this whole idea that, you know, young women or women are being empowered by these dating sites, yet, you know, there's such toxic places. What can women do to protect themselves when they're going onto those places? I'm going to throw this at you, Katie Cooper, just because I know you've got a couple of young women in your life, young girls mm -hmm. in your life. Um, how do you, you know, Know, make sure that women can protect themselves when they're you know forced to go on these god awful sites to mm. find love i have i'm going to show my age a little bit here because um so i've, I've been with my partner now for five years but we met on rsvp.com and um i went on there because he had to pay to talk to me so <laughs> you know you can send a little kiss and, you know, if they're really just a bit of a dick, they, they tend not to respond because they don't want to pay, right? So, um, you know, that worked for me. Um, but I'd certainly I'll, I'll, I'll actually be leaning and be a little bit honest and vulnerable for a minute. Prior to meeting him, um, I was a regular user of a number of different applications and I had some work to do on myself. So that seeking around um, validation and, and likes and the conversations and, and things like that, you know, I did put myself in a position of, of the potential for abuse and, and did experience some abuse on those platforms. Um, so I think for me, some of the pieces are, you know, what's the reason why you want to be on that platform truly? Like let's peer inside a little bit. That leads to empowerment to kind of go, you know what? You're not the kind of guy that I want to actually talk to and I'm, I'm either going to, you know, say no or yay. And the other piece was a really simple one for me, which uh, connected my partner and I, was ask questions that are really meaningful that can generate a conversation. So my favourite one was, tell me about your favourite movie and why. What's your favourite soundtrack and why? Where, where's your favourite place on earth and why? If they can't answer that, piss them off. Like, Susan, excuse me, Sue. Um, but, you know, they're just going to go down the path of sending you a dick pic as soon as they can. Yeah. Meredith, what advice would you have on those kinds of, um, you know, it's been a long time since I've been anywhere near a, a dating. I didn't, there were no such things as apps when I was last dating. So, you know, but what can women do to protect themselves? Because this is the way, right? You have to go online now to find um, somebody, COVID notwithstanding. What advice would you have? Yeah, um, <laughs> that was entertaining. Um, yeah, look, it, it's, I, I think the issue is that, um, and you can't really say this without sounding like a prude, but be careful what the image you're putting out there is. That's the biggest thing. And it's not saying, you know, cover yourself up or anything like that. It's not, none of those sort of things. But as Katie was saying, be, be aware of what you're looking for and stick to that. Um, but be aware of what your profile then, if specifically in a dating app, be aware of your, what your profile is actually putting out there as well. I mean, if you're out there looking for, I don't know, um, a, like a, a, a relationship versus like a one night stand type thing on those dating apps. And, um, but the thing is, is that you're only going for a certain kind of guy or something like that. And, but you're, the image you're putting out there is I want a relationship, but then you've got a picture of yourself in a bikini in a hot tub um, or something like that. It's not, 
it's definitely not shaming what you look like or anything like that, but it's about the, the whole thing. Your profile is a profile. So you can protect yourself just by making sure of what that whole thing is like as a whole, what is the image you're putting out there? What is the information you're putting out there? So protect yourself in a way um, by being true to yourself. I guess that's really what I want to say. You can protect yourself in that way. You you're going to get attention from the wrong guys and the right, and the, the right guys and the right girls, all the rest of it. Um, but you need to be picky um, and be careful in terms of read everything and be aware of the, your image that you're putting out there. That's a really interesting one because I know some of, you know, my friends who have um, teenage daughters who really struggle with that, you know, you should have a right to wear anything you damn please, except it's the response of, of guys out there and what kind of attention you're going to attract. So it's really one of those double-edged swords in terms of the message that you're putting out. But I do think that's really important. It's just like, what's the whole, what's somebody else going to, from the outside, be looking in and seeing? Emily, what are your thoughts on this? How can women protect themselves? Um, I really liked the point uh, Katie made about um, looking at what you're looking for. Um, and I've also used dating apps in the past and I've had good and bad experiences. And the bad ones came when you were looking for, well, when you had work to do on yourself, I think, to also be vulnerable when, um, you know, uh, your self-esteem is low or you're looking for validation or whatever it is. And then you're just matching with whoever and particularly if they're good looking and even if they're boring and then they're shit. Oh, sorry for swearing as well. But <laughs> uh Sorry. We said dick before, Emily. It's fine. We can say whatever we like. Yeah. Okay, Sorry, great. So. Free, for, free for all. Um, so I think I think that's a good point. I guess I'm uncomfortable, to be honest, to a degree with the idea of, of um, worrying about what you're wearing or that sort of thing. Um, I know that's not what Meredith meant uh, in, in, you know, a slut shamey sort of way. Um, but, you know, there's been some really interesting stories of... Uh, women who you know for example even the Knox grammar story I don't know if anyone's seen that lately and that was a real life incident where a man um, told a woman to put her tits away uh, inverted commas and then he punched her in the face when she reacted um, dating is bad wherever it happens or it can be bad because some people are bad uh, so I think just taking online whatever you would do in the real world and being true to yourself, as, as Meredith and Katie said, I, I think is really vital to having better experiences if you're entering those sorts of, of platforms. Mm. And I think it's, um, Emily, the education too. So I have a, um, a, a couple of young daughters. I've, I've got one edging on 18 um, that um, was um, exposed to some really quite volatile um awful experiences on Snapchat and um, interestingly enough uh, that e-safety uh, policy legislation that you shared with us today Karen um, would have been an amazing tool to have used for her had it been in um, in existence during that time so I think it's it's a it's a what it's an education around you know what what is what is actually safe you know like if we if we want to stay safe, what might that look like? Versus, I know, um, you know, what I used to wear to the uni bar um, <laughs> during O week would have put me in the same situation if I had had Snapchat. To be truthful, like, um, so I think it's it's a jet. It's definitely hasn't changed. It's just amplified because the 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 platform for it has has become so um, uncontrollable. And can I, I sorry, oh, sorry, no, Karen, no, please, I'm not no, a dating or sexuality expert, obviously, but there needs to be spaces where women and young women in particular can perform sexuality online, which they're doing increasingly without receiving abuse in response or harassment in response. And again, that goes back to societal issues. Mm, I agree. Yeah. Absolutely. We still have this idea that you have to be the virgin or the whore, right? Whereas men can yeah. do exactly what they want. I mean, we still, there's so much structural stuff that is just there. Did you want to add something there, Meredith? No, the virgin and the whore was exactly right. <laughs> <laughs> um, I want to shift a little bit to um, 
I guess, a different take on putting yourself out there. And that's your data. You know, at the moment, we're all just data machines, aren't we? Every, th every time we're online, um, we are sharing all manner of data about, you know, our shopping habits, etc. I want to bring you in here, Casey. Um, it used to be that cash was king, now that data is king. How can people benefit from their own data? I'll bring Katie in on this as well. But first, Casey, tell us a little bit about maybe the so, so, um, cyber security elements of what's out there and what people can actually find out about you. I think I think it's a big question, and there are lots of um, <clears throat> there are lots of new businesses, there are lots of startups that are are looking into the idea of people benefiting, particularly financially, from their own data. That are looking into the opportunities to. Um, you know, to, to kind of uh, be a bit of a, I, I guess, a middleman, a, um, a broker um, for that data so that you can actually generate some revenue from it. Uh, unfortunately, one of the one of the outcomes of the, you know, the internet being this great place for freedom is that um, for a long time, people were just, you know, uh, abhorred the idea of, of spending any money for anything that they received online. And that's changing now, you know, with the, the advent of all the, of these content subscriptions, that, that is really changing. And there's a lot more kind of revenue that's generated from that stuff. But as you say, Karen, we're still in this position where a lot of the kind of, you know, communications platforms, um, a lot of the interaction with other people, all of that stuff is happening on platforms that, um, you know, you're, you're not paying for a service, you're actually the product that's getting on sold. And so all of the data that you are providing to all of these platforms is uh, is what's actually paying for those, those services to exist. And, and so you don't have to actually pay any money for it. Um, and it's not new. <clears throat> My least favourite example of it, um, which has existed for a long time, is frequent shopper clubs. Um, because that they, they are absolutely making a mint off the data that they're getting, and Woolworths, I think, um, you know, they started providing a an insurance um, product about probably five years ago. It could be longer than that now. I'm getting old, so times, you know, shorter and shorter. But um, they actually would determine someone's insurance risk based on their shopping habits um, at the supermarket. And people didn't know that that's what was happening. There was no transparency around it at all. You would go onto the Woolworths thing and you put your details in and it would do the same stuff that every other insurance website would do, but it would then have a look at, uh, do you have frequent shopper or whatever it's called now? Um, and it would have a look at your your shopping habits and it would compare your shopping habits to other people whose risk profile it knew and then it would impact your risk profile on that basis. And if people were going into a supermarket looking at what they were buying, what they were putting in their trolley and thinking, hang on, if I buy the you know 24 pack of Coke rather than the 30 pack of Coke, is that going to make my insurance more expensive? Then there's going to be a whole lot more questions that people would ask. And I think that that's a really it's a it, it's a it's a useful um, comparison to make because one it, it's true, but also it's a good way to think about what what is happening online. So you're going on Facebook and you're um, you know you, you see an article on the ABC and you go and share it um, on your Facebook profile. That actually impacts a whole lot of things in your life. And compare that to you know you might share a news.com.au article or you might share an article from one of those fake news websites. The fact that that you are the kind of person who would do one of those things will impact, you know, you couldn't even list them. Basically, everything that you could possibly do online, there's this profile built around you. And it's all based on artificial intelligence. Like, no one's actually looking at that and building a profile around you. It's all based on artificial intelligence. And artificial intelligence is... Um, it uh, inherently benefits those that already have privilege because it's already based on this idea that the least risky people are the people with the privilege, you know, whatever that might be. It's based on kind of, uh, you know, the, the artificial intelligence has been taught by people that are already in powerful positions in society what it should be looking for and therefore it's looking for the gold standard of people like those people and the other end of the scale are people that have no similarities to them at all. And so what that, that means is that on this, this enormous scale, it's not just, okay, well, I won't buy my insurance from Woolworths anymore. That data is shared everywhere. You simply cannot escape it. And the scariest thing about it is that you just, you just don't even know where it might be following you around. 
I think I've gone on a mad segue from the question, Karen, but um, no, no, I'm sure no, Katie will right. bring it's it back a great to question. Say. No, yeah. no, it was a brilliant answer. Um, but Katie, yeah, how do you monetize mm. your own data? How do you take that control of all that data that Facebook and Instagram and co are stealing from you? Yeah, so it's really interesting to build on what Casey was actually saying. The, the, um, the open banking legislation or the consumer um, data right legislation that's coming to effect effectively enables a vetted group of people to ask um, an individual to share their information for a financial service or a product. Um, so I can go to ComBank and I can say, actually, you know what? I've kind of got this stuff going on over here. You need to give all my transactional data to that group and I consent to it. Um, when you're doing that, the value of that data is actually quite incredible. So, which, you know, ComBank, for example, has 25 million uh, unique customers that are effectively the, the psyche of the Australian population in their transactional data, right? And so for an individual to say, you know, I want to give some of that information to another provider, it's conscious but value exchange happening. So we've got to educate ourselves that that has value and that I should actually, in order to do that, I should be asking for something significant in return. And that could be a lower rate on, an in, on a, um, a short-term loan. It could be, you know, a zero-free um, setup for a new home loan. All of those things, we've got to see the value in that information that we're trading. Um, I've heard stories of, um, you know, Reddit users posting their full Facebook um, information and selling it for $860, I think, US. So I think it's definitely worth it little bit more than that but it's really about educating ourselves that you have your own data individual data sovereignty um, a freemium model will always be about sucking your data always be thinking about okay well what does a premium offer give me and what do I get in exchange for that behavior right so you know the Spotify family model is really interesting because they're effectively curated an intergenerational music platform with a whole stack of AI built into it. But if you, in order to access that, you pay a premium rate. It also then means that, you know, my 11-year-old daughter doesn't get any explicit music. Well, that's actually okay for me. That's a trade-off. That's a value exchange. Um, so really just thinking and being informed about what that value um, is when you're exchanging. And I think we will see, thanks, Casey, for the update on the startup space, we will see this broker, this data broker business um, starting to explode over the next few years. And um, there already is one in New Zealand called Aho, which is um, very specific to Maori tribes and the exchange of personal data and use in governments um, for a specific purpose for a specific period of time. And in fact, that's built with a bias to protect Maori culture, not, um, not a privilege bias, which is really interesting. And I think that will start to emerge much more over the next few years. Meredith, given that the data equals money these days, um, is that why the platforms are so reluctant to act? Because it's, you know, any activity is great activity, whether it's negative, whether it's, you know, destructive, etc. I think so. Um, yeah, just harking back to the day off Twitch, I mean, that's great. It did it, it gave their revenue a bit of a chuck <laughs> there but at the same time is is that what fantastic publicity for twitch um it was literally people who hadn't heard of it before have heard of twitch now um people who have not heard of the horrific things going on on twitch there's, there's now media attention on all of that and people are writing about them they're writing features on it i mean it's all whatever whenever they see the word twitch now um it's you know negative or positive it's all data yeah um and yeah more and more people we've we've now got i've i've just seen like the huge influx of viewers that come into everybody's channels these days um, that weren't there before the 1st of September. Not saying it's because of that, but but I would say a, a large chunk of it is. So yeah, I think it's just, um, I mean, data talks. It really does. Um, data is money um, and money talks. It's the same thing. It's an extension. Um, so yeah, and we're all constantly giving our data away, whether we like it or not on Twitch, uh, um, on anything really, but especially on Twitch, every time, every second that I'm on the camera, that's data for them um, as well. It's collection, everything. Um, so yeah, I think it's, um, we're get, yeah, I think we, we are definitely seeing um, the the exchange of data um unfortunately is um very much increasing for the platforms and whether they're going to use that for good or not is still to be seen i think 
Um, I want to just talk a little bit about doxing. There's been that famous um, recently, or infamous, I guess, um, former Liberal turned United Australia Party MP Craig Kelly has been um, texting, SMSing people up the yin-yang. People got fed up with it. His mobile phone number was put on um, in the public sphere by journalists um, and he's had to change it a number of times. Emily, I want to ask you fair, is it fair? Uh, I want to ask you first, is it fair? He was texting a lot of people who didn't want to be contacted. They were intruding, he was intruding on their space. So are there times when the means justifies the ends? I haven't come to a conclusion on this one, to be really honest. I'm uncomfortable with uh, fighting fire with this one. Um, we all know that there's this strange part of, of the relevant legislation that allows political parties to spam Australians and to borrow the point of someone who may or may not be on this panel. I think what this really exposed was uh, this the issue that we, we have with that particular loophole. And ironically, when I was reading back about this, um, Clive Palmer actually promised via spam text to ban, to ban spam text from politicians back in 2019. Um, but it's not in it's not in political parties' interest to go through with this, is it? Now there was also a local example, and it's kind of different. But in 2011, a union boss here read out the premier's phone number to uh, a crowd of angry nurses, um, and she had to change her mobile number. Now that's a different kind of example. That one makes me very uncomfortable, to be honest. Uh, that's about someone's personal safety. Um, Craig Kelly is doing what I think is the wrong thing by sending misinformation to people and some of them would be vulnerable people who are going to believe it and that is really dangerous. So again, um, in classic journalist or ABC journalist fashion, I haven't um, said much, but I've said a lot of words. <laughs> I haven't said my opinion because I don't I don't quite know where I, where I land on this one, to be honest. Meredith, Casey or Katie, any of you wanting to weigh in on that one? What are your thoughts? Meredith, go for it. Um, yeah, I have a pretty strong opinion about it. Um, so basically, uh, yeah, I totally agree with Emily. Like it, it, what what is being done so in terms of what these people that are being doxxed have been doing um i'm not passing judgment on that because essentially yeah it's usually appalling behavior that causes this um and but sometimes it's not um but doxing in particular is a huge problem um uh, doesn't matter whether you're online or in person doxing doxing is quite incredibly um it's got a lot of flow on effects um whether you're just like the Craig Kelly example, whether you're just um, releasing a probably work mobile phone, I think <laughs> related related um, to 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 the public, um, which is just it's it does invite harassment. It's fighting fire, like I said, fighting fire with fire. It's actually um, it's it's that whole thing about you know two wrongs don't make a right, that sort of thing. You mentioned does the means justify the ends? Um, it needs to. <laughs> Uh, it really does. The behaviour needs to really be elevated a lot more than it is. Doxing is about as low as you can get. Um, and essentially it happens a lot to streamers, a lot to, a lot to people online in general, but it happens a lot and people don't talk about it. Um, the amount of people being doxxed on a daily basis would actually shock. <laughs> um, and that's just as simple as I mentioned again, just the, the botting and that sort of thing that happens to streamers. That another version of botting of that is when they dox and the bots will all have names of things like they'll, they'll get your personal information and you have your address as a name of a box of a bot and your phone number will be the name of a bot and it just gets spammed in. Yeah. So essentially thousands of people could be watching you and they all get your personal details. So um, it's that sort of thing. That's just one example. And it has, has happened a lot. It's happened to me. Um, and, uh, but again, just in terms of do we, do we dox? No. <laughs> then meet that, in that sort of instance, the means never justify the end um, because you, the end then moves. There's no, there's no end. It just, um, it will keep going. So unfortunately, yeah, it's not the way, best way to go. But I think the, in terms of the, the means justify the ends, I think they have to. I think they have to. I'm going to, um, we're going to start to wrap up soonish in the next couple of minutes. Casey, I'm going to put, to, you're the only bloke, and um, I guess we're trying to understand why men do what they do and why good men don't always intervene and stand up. Um, and I don't, I'm not blaming you, I'm not trying to make you speak for all men's, but if you can give us a bit of insight, that might help a little. Yeah, I think there'd be a lot of men that would be very upset at the idea of me speaking on their behalf, <clears throat> but that's all right, I don't really care. Um, look, I think, I think, and it's been said a bunch of times, like this is a, this is a broad social issue. 
And, uh, you know, I've got a, a, a two, nearly three year old son um, and I have some nephews and I get angry quite often at some of the things that my nephews are taught by my own family in terms of how I could see that impacting the way that they behave, uh, you know, behave to other people in society now at the age they're at, um, how they might behave as, as young adults and how they might behave as adults. Um, because I think, you know, the only, the only right thing to do with the, you, you can't shake the privilege that you're born with, right? Like you can't, you can't avoid the fact that it's there and it doesn't matter how much you try, it's impossible. You know, you've, you've, you've got this, you know, society gives it to you, you can't not have it. And so I think that the only reasonable thing to do with it is to lift people who don't have it. Um, so you use your privilege to help others to be able to get to the, you know, the, the point that you get by default. Um, and so I think that that really it's about continually improving the way that we bring up men into this society. That is the only way that's going to properly change um, the situation that we're in. Everything else is, you know, like obviously we can't just go, okay, well, don't worry about the men that are here now. We'll just make sure the next generation's a bit better and the generation after that's a bit better. Obviously, like that's not a solution to the problem, but that's that's the only way to actually change the problems that we have. Um, I think you know that that men who who want to want to help. Um, I was going to say want to be seen to help, but I, you know that's a, another problem that we have. And the men that want to be seen to help, but there's no kind of um, sincerity help. to it. Yeah, <laughs> men that actually want to help, they need to be making those decisions when they when not only when they interact with women or you know people without the privilege they've got. Uh, but when they, you know, when they vote, when they choose where to, you know, with, which companies to um, uh, to support, you know, every little thing that they do, they need to be thinking, okay, well, what's the what's the privilege here, and what can I do with the privilege that I've got to make this, you know, make this better for other people? And I think that the really sad thing is that the situation that we're in at the moment, the the emphasis is and the onus is always on the uh, the the people of the you know the lower privilege so if you are being harassed you need to report it um if you have you know been sexually abused you need to report it so it's always the you know the onus of responsibility is on you know i don't want to use the word victim the, the survivor whatever it might be of the you know of what has happened and there's very little effort happening from people that have the privilege of actually being proactive about it and going, okay, well, how can we take that onus of responsibility away from people? How can we make this not a system where you must report something that happened and actually where we can, we can address the systems that are allowing these things to happen? And we've seen, and you know, Emily's reporting on this has been phenomenal over the last few months. We've seen with a, um, a, an institution that should be leading the way in Tasmania, being the Labor Party, of how to, uh, you know, how to support underprivileged people. Like it's literally what they exist to do. And we have seen a massive failure of that institution in actually looking at itself and going, you know what, we've got a problem here and being proactive about the way they address it. And it's okay. great that that's out in the open, but it's, it's everywhere and we don't see it most of the time. Emily, when you rely on followers, you rely on engage, engagement like so many journalists and people in the public eye do, um, what do you owe them? Do you owe them anything? Uh, again, I don't have an answer to this question yet and I've been pondering it um, quite a bit recently because, as I said, the uh, criticism or questioning um, related to exactly what Casey just talked about, uh, that particular story and polit particular political party has really escalated lately. Um, and that's fine, like people should question and criticise and, and come in. But if it's a weekend and I'm at a brunch with a friend and I've got, you know, people uh, digging at a story I did on the last night's news, do I need to stop the brunch I'm at to, you know, to reply to that? I actually don't have the answer yet. Is Twitter something I use only in work hours? Well, that seems unsustainable. You know, I, I actually don't know the answer yet. And I think that media companies are still grappling with that as well. Um, and even if I am in my work time, do I owe, or do journalists or anyone owe everyone who asks a question an answer all of the time? Am I here to be on call to the audience? Um, 
I should be accountable to the audience for sure, but you spoke about complaints mechanisms, for example. Um, they exist for a reason too. Uh, I am rambling because I, as I said, I, I really have been thinking about this a lot and actually I'd be interested in your thoughts, Karen, but that might be an offline conversation. <laughs> Yeah, I think engagement, it's really hard to balance um, when there is demands on your time. Meredith, I want to put to you, you rely on an audience as well. What do you reckon? Yeah, um, I think you, 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 don't, you, owe them, you owe them truth. I think that's the biggest thing. You owe them, um, it, it's, it depends on your, you and your personality, but essentially um, you do owe them um, the way that you're dealing with things I think so you owe them a bit of truth um I'm just talking about something on someone on tv like for example Karen and, and Emily for example so it's kind of a you you do you, you're, you're visual you've got your face out there so what you do owe them is um a little bit of truth as far as I'm concerned so and that just that can just be as simple as um um an open ear to people as well so I think you owe them some um you owe them some genuine humanity but you also owe them positivity that's the biggest thing because if you continually you can be down of course but I think you owe them um yeah you owe, I think you owe, the, you, owe the, you owe the universe a little bit of positivity anyway so um it does make things a little better for yourself as well I think there are some complications as an ABC reporter versus anything else which is a whole other conversation but this idea that you're paid by the taxpayer um and I've got a right to you as a whole but Emily and I will have that conversation offline Katie Cooper I want you to be uh, we have got one minute to go if you were to kind of look at the top tips that people ought to take away from tonight what would they be um Karen I think one um be really conscious about what intent you want from what platform um two be really clear around your boundaries you know escalate block do whatever you need to if it's if that's your boundary um challenge if you feel comfortable to do so um and i think i really love what casey was saying and from a, a really open place from a, a male perspective around reflection i actually think it's anyone with greater privilege needs to take a, a reflection on why should the victim be the one that has to stand up when I can see the behaviour in front of me. So that's the that's that's a key takeaway for me tonight is the challenge for myself to go, actually, you know, I'm not actually happy with that behaviour. I'm going to call it out. Mm. Brilliant. Um, we could keep going and keep going, but um, we're not going to. Um, I want to thank Emily Baker, an ABC reporter in Hobart, award-winning ABC reporter, Meredith Castles, um, STEB podcaster, uh, Twitch TV uh, broadcaster, design, science, uh, interaction. Fantastic. Um, Katie Cooper, Vice President of TAS ICT, and uh, Casey Farrell from Enterprise Tasmania and Tasmania Cybersecurity Node. I think give them a virtual hand. It's been brilliant. I've been um, I've really enjoyed this. I've learned a lot as well. So I think we're going to hand up um, just to Sue and Tristan for a finale. But thank you, everybody, for being here tonight for um, the really terrific um, exchange of ideas.